alumni and guests, uh, colleagues and friends, um, a very warm welcome to all of you. Um, I'm delighted that you're here, and I really consider it to be a privilege to be able to share this evening with you. Um, we are here to celebrate the work of the International Center for Cooperation and Conflict Resolution. Um, I want you to know that in my role as provost at Teachers College, I'm proud to serve as an advocate for ICCR. And along with you, I'm celebrating the vision and legacy of the center. I'm celebrating the work, uh, first of all, of Morton Deutsch, who's with us here tonight, the legacy and the vision of this man that's given life to <laughs> And here are some things that make me proud. The foundational theory and research that has originated from this center and has worldwide influence. Its abiding commitment to social justice and to linking theory and practice. The popular and outstanding certificate program that this center offers. Uh, its community-based work that really makes us proud of connections and engagement in the community. And its field projects ranging from preschool through the United Nations, local and worldwide. The growing international impact of ICCR and its leadership in bridging complexity theory and social science to make breakthroughs in some of the most intractable problems facing societies. Things like poverty, sustainable development, and building sustainable peace. These are some of the things that are meaningful to me as I think about what we're here tonight to celebrate. Um, let me just bring to a close my own brief remarks before I introduce the two speakers. Um, by just offering you kind of an appeal on what this center needs. Start by imagining the physical space, the little lab in which the center now sits was built in the 1970s. The infrastructure can't support the leading edge work that needs to be done. Now try to imagine the scope and importance of the work of this center going forward the student support needed to carry out that work, and the crucially important outreach that the center needs to do around the globe. It's time now, it's time to invest in this center. So with having said that, it's my pleasure to introduce our two speakers. And I have a whole lot of pages here because we have people that do really great research on backgrounds. So what I'm gonna do is compress this. I mean, I can't take the next <laughs> half hour telling you of all the, the exploits and the achievements of these, these two gentlemen. Uh, John Barkat um, is, first of all, a TC alum. I'm very, very proud of that, you know, given all the things that he's done. Um, he received his uh, PhD in international education in 2001. Um, he is the center's very first recipient of the Conflict Resolution Certificate, and we're very proud of what's flowed out of that. Uh, John Barkat took office as the United Nations Ombudsman in April 2008. In that role, he's at the level of Assistant Secretary General in the UN. So he has a wide purview and wide scope of operations. He functions independently as befits the Ombudsman's role, um, ranging across um, many of the activities of the UN. And he has direct access constantly to the Secretary General of the UN. You know, so he's operating in a, in a mode that's really in tune with what that organization is doing. Um, he's an expert in mediation and conflict resolution. Um, he has an emphasis in his own work on organizational and cross-cultural communication, very appropriate to the UN. And he's previously worked at the UN as a negotiations instructor, a consultant in ombudsman programs, and an advisor on reforms having to do the administration of justice. Now I'm gonna pass over here um, another long list of professional accomplishments. Ombudsman role with the university, um, leading organizations, um, his affiliations with major associations across different professions using this expertise. Um, he has been a past president of the International Ombudsman Association, you know, giving you, you a sense of his stature in the field. Um, in addition to his uh, PhD from Columbia, he also holds an MPA um, in 
um, government from Pace and a BA in psychology from King's College. So I, as I say, I'm, I'm really cutting this short, you know, but I wanted just to give you some flavor of, of what he has done. But let me say a few words now about our other speaker, Peter Coleman, my friend and colleague at Teachers College. So most recently, and this is gonna draw our attention tonight, uh, Peter's the author of a new book, The 5%, Finding Solutions to Seemingly Impossible Conflicts. And so that, that's gonna be the focal point tonight of the dialogue between these two men. Um, they're going to be engaging in a lively um, debate, theory and practice, um, looking at our most difficult conflicts, you know, with examples, with some new thinking and new ways of working through these. Uh, Professor Coleman holds his PhD and a master's in philosophy from in social and organizational psychology from Columbia University's Teachers College. He also has a bachelor's in communications, which is a useful degree in this kind of work, uh, from the University of Iowa. Um, he's the director, as you know, of the center of ICCCR. Um, he's our leader in that respect, and he's also the, um, an affiliate of the International Center for Complexity and Conflict in Warsaw, Poland. He's done a wide range of research, um, books, over 40 journal, journal articles, chapters, conference papers, and he's really focused on the formation of in-groups and out-groups in conflict situations, on the mediation of inter-ethnic conflict, on intractable conflict, complexity, identity formation, moral emotions, and the conditions and processes that foster constructive use of social power in situations of great conflict. I'll just mention one or two more things and then we'll cut to the chase and, and get them up here and they can start talking. Um, in 2003, he was the first recipient of the Early Career Award of the American Psychological Association, Division 48, which is the study of peace, conflict, and violence. So we're very proud of that award. He was recognized for the accomplishments in his career. So together, John Barkat and Peter Coleman are going to explore the 5% of disputes that are doomed to become intractable quagmires. And they're going to offer some cutting edge ideas and they're going to engage in dialogue with you about you know, where, where to go with this, this problem that we have worldwide. And I, I have just a couple of notes here about it. They're going to say more, but you know, one note that I found interesting, because we think of worldwide conflict, societies and social movements. You know, but if, if one in every 20 conflicts, if 5% of all conflicts, end up grinding to a halt and becoming intractable. And we also have to remember that's not only conflicts that are international or political, it's also referring to disputes and arguments in our everyday life. Domestic, inter interpersonal, relationship disputes, office disputes, subway disputes, whatever it might be. <laughs> so what they're talking about is something that's in the stream of our daily existence for all of us, not just in the large scale conflicts that we see worldwide. And that's something that I find especially interesting about it. So I think that's actually a good launching pad for what we're going to hear, what you're going to witness tonight in the dialogue of these um, two men. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, he hearing your, your CV or your life like that is kind of like having your life flash before your eyes. It was somewhat intimidating. Thank you so much for coming out tonight, coming out on this beautiful spring night. <laughs> And I want to thank Tom James uh, for his lovely remarks. I want to thank uh, Rosella Garcia and, I want to, and Suzanne Murphy and the Development Office for organizing this. I want to thank the center, um, Claudia Cohen, Juliet uh, DeWolf, and Molly Clark, and Connie and Beth Fisher, and Steen Chong is here. So we have a big group who's helped organize this tonight. So thank you to all of you. Um, I also want to honor Mort Deutsch. Uh, Mort Deutsch is my mentor and, and uh, my colleague, and I've stole everything I can from him. So much of what I say tonight will be Deutschian. Um, and then I want to thank John Barquette. John Barquette is uh, an old friend. I've known John a long time. I think when we first met, we both had luscious, dark hair. And so things have changed a little bit, uh, but it's been a while. And John has uh, gone on to do great work um, that has a, a really a global impact. And uh, so I really appreciate you taking the time to come out and, and speak with us, speak with me. 
So we are going to talk tonight about uh, tackling our most impossible conflicts. And um, this is an area of research that I've been involved in for something like 15 years. Uh, and, and what I plan to do is talk about some of the ideas, uh, to um, talk a little bit about our approach to thinking about these things in very different ways, uh, and then um, to uh, turn it over to John, who will talk uh, more in a grounded way, I think, about his experience working. He's just come back from a, a tour of some conflict zones, so he's going to speak to uh, his, experience, uh, his experiences there. Um, so uh, one of the things I want to emphasize is that I'm going to say tonight that these conflicts are different than most of the conflicts, 95% of the conflicts we face in our life. They have a different set of rules. They operate with a different set of dynamics. Um, and they're, oddly enough, attractive. There are conflicts that sort of draw us in, despite our uh, intention to not be drawn in. But they have a power of their own that sort of brings us in and, just, and con constrains us and contains us. I argue that we, don't, that we haven't really understood them and so in many ways have mishandled them or have not understood the impact of our work, how our work impacts them. Um, I'm also going to argue that you can't bring peace to these situations, you can't make peace happen, that that kind of thinking is part of the problem, but that in these situations oftentimes the potential for peace and the potential for conflict simultaneously exists. There are sort of alternative realities that exist in these relationships and in these situations. Uh, and, and even in times of war, there can be great potential for peace. And in times of peace, as we'll see, there's oftentimes a potential for relapse and war. Um, so that's uh, what I'll talk about. So the, to, to begin tonight, I'm going to actually put you to work for just a minute. And I'm going to ask you, if you can, I don't know if this works, but you can hear, can you hear me? OK. Uh, now you can definitely hear uh, um, I'm going to put you to work for a second and ask you to have a, about a 60-second conversation with someone next to you, ideally someone you don't know. Um, so you may want to just turn and introduce yourself to whoever is sitting next to you. We're going to talk about impossible conflicts, what we call intractable conflicts, conflicts that seem to have a life of their own that go on and on despite people's weariness, despite people's good faith attempts to solve them, they somehow seem to resist that kind of change. And so I want you to talk for just a minute or so about one specific conflict and, um, and share with your partner your sense of why this particular conflict is so seemingly impossible to solve. We thought we'd start, John and I thought we'd start small with something kind of manageable for you to think about. So if you don't mind, please take the start here. <laughs> can't talk about intractable conflict without thinking about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So take 60 seconds, turn to your partner, and explain to them why this particular conflict has been so impossible to solve. I was listening into your conversations, and I took some notes. And so what I heard was uh, that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is intractable because it's a 100-year-old conflict that probably started at the demise of the Ottoman Empire after World War I, that there were at the time kind of arbitrary distinctions imposed on the countries, that the international uh, community has continued uh, resource interests and strategic interests. There are, has been unstable governance and underdevelopment in the region. There's a long history of persecution of Jews leading to the atrocities of the Holocaust, which contribute to of the Zionist movement to bring Jews to Palestine and then the creation of the Jewish state. In addition, there's been a long history of humiliation, displacement, wars, and occupation of Arab Palestinians by Israelis and others, long-standing existence of other cultural and ethnic rivalries, emergence of identities which are, in, by definition, opposed to each other. There's scarce competition for scarce territory, for victim status in the community. There have been very powerful militant movements which have contributed the monotheists to really compete for the primacy in the eyes of their god. Uh, many, many failed attempts by the international community and regional communities to bring peace. Lobbyist groups here and across Europe that support and fund the different parties, the spread of terrorism, demographic concerns as the demographic shift in Israel, 
export of Western, of Christians, uh, Middle East Christians to the West, socialization, teaching, water conflicts, uh, a commitment to violence, to com combat violence, and the uh, feeling of obligation to revenge those that have, have died in this war. So that's what I heard. <laughs> And, and, and my, my sense of this conflict is, is that, yes, this is basically why it's probably intractable. Um, or as put by a, a, a participant in a study of ours um, in 2002, she said, one of the things that frustrates me about this conflict, thinking about this conflict, is that people don't realize the complexity, how many stakeholders there are in there. I think there's a whole element to this particular conflict to where you start the story, to where you begin the narrative. And clearly, it's whose perspective you tell it from. One of the things that's always struck me is that there are very compelling narratives to this conflict and all are true in as much as anything is true. I think the complexity is on so many levels, complexity of geographic realities, it's in the relationships, it has many different ethnic pockets, and I think it's fighting against a place where particularly in the US and American culture we want to simplify. We want easy answers, we want to synthesize it down to something that people can wrap themselves around and take a side on and sometimes I feel overwhelmed. I cherish this quote because it really captures some of the themes that um, Professor Barquette and I will cover tonight. Um, there are sort of two or three major themes. One is that we live in a time of increasing complexity and interdependence in conflict situations and just globally. If you are part of the 23% of Americans that believe in evolution and evolutionary theory, so only 23% of Americans do, um, and, you, and you're familiar with the science, you'll know that if you, we dig down into the, uh, into the past the crust of the Earth, deep enough, we come to a level where there are only single-celled uh, amoebas or, or, or bacteria. And then if you come up a little bit, there's two-celled and four, and then it gets more and more complex until you get to the top where it's New York City and it's chaos, right? Um, and what's interesting to note is not only has the world become more complex in many different ways, but the rate at which that complexity increases has increased. So things are getting more and more complex at a greater and greater pace. And that's the context of the world that these events, such as the Middle East and others, are unfolding in. Similarly, there is a basic proclivity for change, development, and evolution in any kind of human social system. So things are constantly changing. And if you notice, there are sort of different scales of change. As we sit here, some of us are losing our hair, some of us are losing skin cells, there are minor change happening, and then there are things that are happening over our lifetime. And then oftentimes there are things happening across generations uh, that we don't understand, we often don't think about because we live approximately 80 to 100 years if we're lucky, so we tend not to think beyond that. Um, and these two facts, the increasing complexity, the rate of complexity of our world, and the fact that it's constantly transforming and changing, place extraordinary demands on our ability to make sense of situations that are complex, such as the Middle East, um, or even conflicts sometimes in our own family. They, they place extraordinary demands on our, our meaning-making uh, mechanisms and cause us to feel oftentimes anxious and hopeless, and in response to that, we will oversimplify. It's how we sort of get a hold and make sense of the world. So even characterizing the conflict that you were all talking about as the Palestinian-Israeli conflict is oversimplifying. It's a conflict that exists within each community. There are multiple sects with, between the communities, between the Israelis and the Arab world, between the, the Israelis, Palestinians, and the international community. So it's a multi-level, multi-layered conflict, and our attempt is oftentimes to try to make sense by oversimplifying these problems, which oftentimes exacerbate those very problems. So what I'm going to try to talk about as quickly as possible is uh, a little bit of context of, of conflict today. Um, as Tom James mentioned, the, the ideas that we'll put forth today, we believe have merit and value for conflicts of all types, conflicts in families, conflict in, in communities and schools and organizations. Um, but where the, they have been most studied is in the international domain. So we'll start there, talk a little bit about some of the uh, context of conflict today. Then I'll explain the ideas and a little bit of the method before I turn it over to Professor Barquette, who will make it all real for us. 
Okay, so the International Crisis Group, uh, which is a non, uh, an NGO, is currently monitoring 70 conflicts in the world. As of today, four are in crisis, 10 are deteriorating, 56 are the status quo, and two have recently improved. They update this daily. The good news is, um, if you look at global conflict, is that there's been a sharp decrease in international between state conflicts since the end of the Cold War. So they have decreased, although at the same time there has been an increase of civil wars, intrastate wars. Fortunately, they, uh, civil wars peaked in 90, 1991, and, and after that came down precipitously, um, and, and by 2003 they were, had dropped by about uh, 40%. Also important to know is that there have been very dramatic increases in the, in the number of wars ended through negotiation, and this has flipped since before the Cold War. It used to be that there were twice as many that ended in military victory, and now there are twice as many that end in negotiation. So something more Deutsch and his students are do, did uh, is working and is taking home. From 1980 to 2003, more wars ended through negotiation than had, than had ended through negotiation in the previous two centuries. So there is good news, and there is a sense of hope. However, about 25% of the wars that end through negotiation relapse in five years. And in some cases, when that relapse happens, there is worse violence than there had been before the peace agreements. What we find is states that have civil war are much more likely to experience new violence, and the longer they last, the greater the chance of them recurring again. Civilian casualty rates have skyrocketed again in World War I. Casualty rates were down in the teens to about 20% of civilians. Now, casualty rates in these are, are somewhere upwards of 80 and 90 percent. Schools are targeted, children, women are targeted, hospitals are targeted. So the, the style of warfare has changed radically. Um, today, 42 percent of children that are out of school around the world, 28 million children, are in the 35 conflict-affected nations, most conflict-affected nations today. So of the conflicts that the International Crisis Group is monitoring, of the 70 conflicts, about 15 of them have lasted from one to 10 years, 12 from about 11 to 20, and then 43 of them have lasted more than 20 years. So they've lasted at least a generation, which is the area that we will focus on. We will focus on this area of these more, what we call enduring conflicts or enduring rivalries, and, and, and talk primarily about that. All right, so as I said, these conflicts are long-lasting, destructive, although they can ebb and flow in terms of their intensity, but they are usually very resistant to many, many good faith attempts to negotiate them and resolve them through diplomacy, mediation, and oftentimes even they're not responsive to military victory and violence. They just keep going on and on. Um, so there was an important study, there's been some important research done by uh, uh, Paul Deal and Gary Getz they look at a, a database called the Correlates of War database. And what they found is that they looked over almost 200 years, from 1816 to 2001, and they looked at all the interstate conflicts that took place over that time. And what they found is that about 115 of them were what they call enduring rivalries. They, were, they weren't episodic conflicts, but they were long-term problems that would occur um, and lasted over 20 years, where oftentimes you see many, many conflicts, disputes, or wars um, the average, I think, is 36 years of these enduring rivalries. Now, that means that somewhere between 5 and 8 percent, depending on how you count it, of uh, international rivalries, which are difficult conflicts that can be contentious and violent and usually are uh, of a competitive nature, about 5 percent of those end up in this stuck place where they endure and go on and on and on. But that small 5 percent is accountable for 50 percent of the wars, 76% of civil wars, and they suck the most resources, cause the most misery and the most pain. So they're a small percentage of difficult conflicts, but they are those that are the most demanding and destabilizing of families, of communities, oftentimes of nations and regions. Um, I want to, again, stress that they occur in families, maybe occurred in some of your families, they've occurred in my family, uh, in organizations and communities, but mostly studied in places like Somalia, Sudan, Angola, uh, Kashmir, etc. Okay, so I was trained by Mort Deutsch, who was trained by a man named Kurt Lewin, and Lewin, when he would study a new area, he would always say, 
try your best to get a sense of the essence of that problem. So no one, um, intractable long-term conflicts hadn't been studied until about 20 years ago extensively. Um, there was a very small community. So there wasn't that much literature, but when I started to work in this area, uh, about 2000, in the year 2000, I broke my foot, was home for two months, and thought, what is the essence of this? And so I started to read everything I could on intractable conflicts. And the good news is that I, I found it. After about two years of study, I was able to identify the essence of uh, intractable enduring conflicts. The bad news is that there were 57 of them. <laughs> that there were legacies of dominance which contribute to it, an instability in a relationship or in a, in a community, an anarchy, deep symbolic issues that are connected to ideology, relationships that are inescapable, zero-sum identities or intense internal dynamics within groups that contribute to intergroup conflict, equal power so that nobody can win, strong emotions, malignant processes, they spread, they create trauma that's oftentimes not effectively treated and so it comes back, it normalizes hostility and violence and they become extremely complex. So there were a variety of different essences of this phenomenon and it's even more complicated than that because these things were um, not only correlated with intractability, but they were correlated with each other. So perceptions of injustice were correlated with how central the issues were, were correlated with sense of enmity and hate and exclusive structures. And so you see basically these 56 variables working together in some ways and being correlated, but not in a linear way, but more sort of like this as a cluster of variables or something like this. So you have situations where you have psychological, social, sometimes cultural and institutional variables that are all somehow feeding each other and leading to uh, a very complex evolving system um, that is difficult to make sense of. But it's not static like this. There are systems that move, that grow and connect like this over time. This is actually an analysis of the MALAC conflict which, uh, which happened at Columbia University. And it shows the feedback loops as it evolved over time. So as these things evolve and grow and spread, one of the paradoxes are that as the more complicated they get and the more threatening they get, the more simple they're seen, right? So as things become more threatening and more complex and there are more, more things involved, the more simple our perception and understanding typically is of them if we are in them. It collapses into a clear sense of sort of us and them. So we have these problems that are multiply linked, complex interactions, they're always evolving, they're all different, and they become very simplified. And this is what we have been trying to study. Now, this is one reason why we argue that these are hard. They're, they're different kinds of phenomenon. They're very tightly coupled systems. They're difficult to make sense of. But I would also argue that our scientific approach to them has been really limited and constrained. Um, that the paradigm with which we have looked at uh, these types of conflicts have been constrained by a typical um, standard approach to social science. Now I want to be clear that we've learned a lot from this approach. But in terms of, of um, phenomenon of this level of complexity, um, we really have a, 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 a challenge in understanding them through this kind of, view, uh, this kind of lens. So let me just stress a couple. Um, most approaches to research in conflict re resolution will look and compare what Mary Parker Follett would say, comparing fluid things to fixed things. Life is fluid. We're fluid, conflicts are constantly changing. But when we do research, we try to get a belief or an attitude or an opportunity structure and understand how that thing explains this fluid. And she said, you can't do that. You have to understand things in terms of their dynamics, in terms of how they change. In a similar way, we often, we really like cause and effect. We like to believe that if you do this, you see an effect. And that is true sometimes. There obviously are cause and effects that happen, but not in systems like this. In systems like this, if you change one, two, or three things, you really don't know the impact it will have on the system as a whole, 
on other aspects of the system, it's nonlinear. So it, it depends on how these things are linked to each other. So if we think about them in terms of cause and effect, we get ourselves in trouble because they don't operate by those rules. They don't operate in sort of proportional rules. Um, let me also say that um, our approach to trying to come up with parsimonious models, simple models that get to the essence, is also part of the problem because as you can see, there are multiple aspects of this. So in response to that, uh, systems theorists have for years been trying to, you know, map the stars of conflict, understand the multiple dimensions of conflict, and that's led us, unfortunately, to models that are extremely complex. Now, maybe you've seen this, but this is, uh, this is um, taken from the New York Times. Uh, it is the U.S. military's um, strategy for trying to increase the popularity of the Afghan government. And so they create these models daily uh, in order to try to understand their system. And as General McChrystal said when he first saw this, he said, when we understand this, we'll have won the war. <laughs> so it's not, it's not that I want to argue that there is no value in this, but it is th these types of models are so overwhelming that it's really hard to know what utility they have and what to do with them. And what we believe is that um, any approach to these types of problems requires both. It requires a sense of the forest and a focus on particular areas that will have a, a, a specific impact. So it requires the ability to understand the context, but then to work um, in a more focused way. The final thing I'll say about my final complaint, um, this is all in the new book if you want to read it, but the final complaint is um, there's a German scientist, uh, psychologist named Dietrich Dorner who's written a book called The Logic of Failure. And Dorner argues that there is probably more harm done in this world by people who are well-intentioned and trying to do good things, but aren't aware of the unintended consequences of their action, than there are by people who are actually trying to do bad things, create, create harm. And that we have to be very mindful and, and try to understand the unintended implications. So in our science, typically we'll do a study, we'll test a hypothesis, and if the hypothesis isn't supported, the study's not published, we figure out another way to support that. But we rarely do we say, well, what did we learn? What, what has happened here? How, what were the unintended effects of what we did? And can we learn from that and grow? And it's, it's that kind of thinking, the understanding beyond what we anticipate in a linear way that we think is critical uh, for this perspective. Okay, so we argue that to some degree they're misunderstood and mishandled. So this is my group, Lanboy Roshenska, Andre Bartley, Larry Leibovich, who's an astrophysicist, Andre Novak, Robin Valaker, Naira Musalam, and Ula Johamsik are, is a group that we've been working with. Um, it's a multidisciplinary team to apply complexity science to these problems. This is my, my students in the lab. Some of them are here. Um, and we've been trying to understand how these things evolve and spread and organize and ultimately collapse into things like this. <laughs> so uh, to just give you a sense of the basic idea, I'm gonna ask you if you can to tell me what you see here. What, what do you see? Sorry? Anything? There's something there, there really is. Anybody see anything? Yes, what do you see? Face of a man with a beard. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, okay. Face of the, anybody else? Yes? A person on a flying horse. Person on a flying horse, okay. Anybody else? Yes. Pelvic bones. Pelvic bones, okay, yes. Uh, anybody else see anything? A map? A map, okay, yeah. Okay. Okay, land mass, <laughs> islands, water, okay. Anybody else? Yes. Dragon, Dragon. okay, yes. Uh, okay, so this uh, image is called the Gestalt Man. There is a, supposedly a man. This is him. 
He has a beard. This is his mustache and, and chin. This is his cheekbone, his nose, and his other cheekbone. That's an eye. And that's a face. <laughs> now, who sees it? OK. What's interesting to me is um, when you don't see it. <laughs> because we as humans don't like this, right? We don't like when there is clearly a picture there, right? But, it, but, but it's hard to make sense, right? Anybody see it yet? Mustache, beard, no? All right, we've got about, a, I think about a third of the group that's seen it. How many have seen it so far? Oh, it's growing. Okay, so they more and more see it. Yeah, so about a third of the group can see it, okay? So again, what I want to point out here is this, this is a picture, um, but it, at first it's black and white. It's hard to make sense of it. Um, and when we see things of this nature, when we see an image like this, uh, that we can't quite make sense of. It does raise in us a sense of tension. And we really feel this dissonance, particularly when someone says, oh, it's this, and you don't see it. And then half the group says, of course it's a man, and the other half can't quite see it. We don't like that. We don't like not being able to put things together, right? We don't like dissonance. We like consistency, coherence, and fit. We love Hollywood endings. We love it when it comes together and we can make sense of it, okay? This basic phenomenon, the need for us to, what, they, what we call a press for coherence, it, it operates for us perceptually, it operates in our relationships. So we don't like it if we have a friend and an enemy and they like each other, because it feels wrong. We don't like it when our friends like our enemies, right? We like balance, we like consistency, we like things to fit. And this is a basic idea that we call the crude law of coherence and conflicts. We argue that human beings are driven toward consistency and coherence in, in how they perceive and how they think, how they act. Cognitive dissonance theory would say if you act in some way and would have a different attitude, you will do whatever you can to reconcile that because it doesn't feel right. Um, so we're driven towards that, and conflict will intensify that drive. And to some point, that's functional, because we like to have a coherent sense of where we are in conflict, what's important, who are they, who are we. But sometimes it, there is a collapse. There is a collapse of our understanding, and it can sort of self-organize and become, to some degree, patho pathological. And then again, the more complex and the more threatening these conflicts become, the more, the greater the drive to simplify them and make sense. But what we found in all kinds of research is that more com complex patterns of thinking and feeling and acting and, and social organizational, uh, organizing in social communities will mitigate against that drive to collapse our sense of us and them. So this is again just uh, one idea, um, or as Mur Murray Gelman said, who's a physicist, uh, complex adaptive systems like us, we're, we're each a complex adaptive system and our relationships are, flourish in the middle region, can exist at the ends. Life can exist in a crystal, in, in a rigid crystal at absolute zero, or in the middle of the sun where there's volatile gas molecules um, in chaos, mm -hmm. that life only exists in balance. And we find this um, pervasive in science, this idea that too much complexity or too much coherence, simplicity, or rigidity um, are, to some degree, um, problematic or pathological. So uh, Dan Siegel has done work looking at the DSM-5 psychological, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual. He's evaluated all of the diagnoses, uh, psychological diagnoses for mental health and mental illness, and what he argues is that either it's too much rigidity or disorganization or some kind of combination of going back and forth. And that by default, mental health is in the middle. It's some kind of a structure that's flexible. So we see the same kind of idea of either complexity, too much complexity or too much rigidity as being problematic. And in situations of intense conflict, protracted conflict, threatening conflict, the drive is always to simplify. There's a strong pull for us to know who are our friends and enemies 
and to make it as simple and as coherent as possible. So mitigating that becomes key. I'm going to give you one quick sense of a study and then wrap it up. We have a laboratory at the center. We bring in people who are opposing in moral conflicts. Uh, pro-life, pro-choice, affirmative action, uh, people that believe in climate change and don't. And we have them come in, we, we understand that they're opposing on an idea. We have them come in and then try to reach consensus on an issue that they will share with a, with a community group. And then what we do is we look at the dynamics of their conversations. We have them talk for a half hour or so and try to reach consensus. And as you can imagine, some of them um, get pretty ugly and get sort of frozen. The facilitator has to step in and, and stop it. And others don't. Others actually get into a different kind of place. They're all people who morally are morally opposed on an issue. And these are issues that are important to them. And they're engaging in this, but they will differ um, in terms of whether they result in more constructive, thoughtful, open conversations or conversations that get stuck and need to be stopped, uh, where the hostility starts to grow. And what we found in our research on this is that we see very different patterns in the same kinds of conversations, moral conflicts, between those that, that go well and those that don't. What we find in um, those that go well is that they have a very complex uh, um, emotional experiences, cognitive experiences. They show a lot of different kinds of behavior. So it doesn't mean that they don't feel bad, they don't get angry, they don't feel negative. Because they're talking about you know, pro-life, pro-choice, and they have a strong feeling about it, and they're trying to convince somebody who has a different point of view. But they, they don't collapse. They're able to stay in a place where even though they're feeling different things, it moves. Their cognition is the same. They're able to think about things in more nuanced ways, and they're able to evidence different kinds of behavior. As opposed to the more destructive conflicts that really collapse. Emotionally, they collapse into a negative state. The behaviors collapse into just pure advocacy, and their thinking becomes very simplified. And so we track these over time to understand what we call attractor patterns in, uh, in these conversations. And this is the kind of data we try to look at. And then we try to work with these ideas um, uh, to, to use them as parameters to introduce change. So we have a lab in Munich, Germany, where we will bring people in who, are, again, are morally opposed on an issue. And then we introduce high and low complexity. For one group, we introduce multiple perspectives on a complex issue like abortion so that it's not just pro and con, but they understand that there are many factors, legal factors, human factors involved. And the other group, we just present pro and con information. And the pro and con people get into a very simple, divisive conversation. Those that are introduced with more nuanced and complex information stay in a place that is much more constructive and satisfying to the participants. Again, even though they're morally opposed. So what I want to say is what we believe happens in these situations is that the very complexity of the situation can collapse into a coherent pattern. What we oftentimes, what, what in applied mathematics they call attractors. Attractors are simply patterns that resist change. They're ways we think or feel or act that no matter what's happening in the world, we can't change them. So a great attractor is red and blue state voting over the last 10 years. If you think about what's happened in our world since 2000, 9-11 has happened, Katrina, there, there have been so many, the bank crisis, the collapse of the world economy, there have been so many things that have changed radically since 2000. But if you look state by state at the red and blue voting within states, there's almost no movement. The red and blue voting is almost identical for every presidential election since 2000. That's an attractor. It's an attractor that draws us in and it, re and it, it, it resists change despite the fact that so many things are changing. So what we argue and have found is that this idea from mathematics is helping us understand how these conflicts collapse, organize, and become coherent, and ultimately how they can be addressed and how they can be changed. Um, so the takeaway I just want to stress is that 
We argue that these conflicts, these problems are atypical. They're different. They have different sets of rules. They're very tightly coupled problem sets that will self-organize and resist change so that even though there are peace treaties, leaders come and go, um, that there is a, can be radical change in the community, but ultimately the conflicts somehow persist. Um, and, and one way to think about these, even though conflicts will differ radically in terms of uh, if there are personal conflicts or community-based conflicts, organizational conflicts or international conflicts, but what we're finding is that there is a shared logic to their dynamics, that how they can organize collapse and then become resistant to change um, is a similar phenomenon across levels. Um, and that in, every, in, in each of these situations, there is usually a hidden propensity for peace. When you're in a relationship, if you've had a long relationship with another person, but it's collapsed into a negative state, you start to ignore and not pay attention to anything positive. But what we found in research in psychology is that information doesn't go away. It goes somewhere. It collects and it gathers. And what that does in a relationship or in a community is it creates the potential for something else, for a, for a different kind of interaction. So in, in some of the cases we've studied, like Mozambique, where there's a 16 years bloody civil war, you see a radical change to peace in approximately two years. So you move out of this stuck system to peace. Or in systems like Rwanda, where you see some hostilities, but then you see a, a radical spike into violence, both peace and conflict exist as attractors in, a rela in relationships and in community systems. So even though a conflict, uh, a community may be only evidencing uh, conflict for, for a long period of time, that potential for peace still exists. So an awareness of the reality of both of those uh, existing at the same time, we think is critical to this approach as well. Um, so finally, um, as I turn it over to John, um, we argue that in these situations you can't make peace. You can't, you, you can't intervene in a complex system and have an outcome that you predict. Complex systems are unpredictable. But what you can do is you can start to look at patterns over time in these systems and you can start to understand what are the main things that will change the pattern. In other words, one of the things you can do is uh, work with probabilities. You can work to decrease the probabilities of violence and destructive conflict, and you can work in ways to increase probabilities for peaceful encounters. And at some point, the system may re reorganize in that way. What we're seeing in Northern Africa right now, in Egypt and Tunisia and elsewhere, Libya, is a, a reorganization of the system, a shock to the system. We don't know if that's going to result in a constructive place or a destructive place. But there are things that authorities in the international community can do to, to increase the probabilities that will re, what will result will be a more peaceful, constructive uh, set of encounters. <laughs>